Cool, well, um, I'm Luke. I'm a director at Snapper Films, and we're working in collaboration with Shift4 here, who are helping us realize, essentially, I guess, like a bit of a dream that I've had. My producer, Jess, she'd worked with Shift4 uh, a load of times before and had, had raved about them, and it, she introduced me to Colin, who told me all about this Shift4 shorts project, and essentially offered to help me make anything I wanted, and I jumped at that opportunity. It's just kind of a bit lost, but eventually you're going to hone in on this cover way of Kevin's crunches. Midnight Snack is a short film about a woman who eats bugs. She wakes in the middle of the night and is seduced by the sound of her television. And it sort of was meant to have a very nightmarish, ritualistic quality to it, something, uh, this kind of thing that she does night after night, and that shows in the condition of her face and sort of playing on loads of different things, people being addicted to things, and us sort of really loving the things that are generally really bad for us. And I had this image of people eating bugs for ages in my mind. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why, but I just, I kind of thought it would make for a really freaky, strong, unusual image. <laughs> but at its core, it's just a sort of fun, nightmarish experience. I've always been a big fan of shows like The Twilight Zone, uh, sort of late night weird tales that are sort of designed to be watched uh, when it's dark outside. And particularly for this, I thought that it was very um, appropriate to have it look quite beaten up and old and grungy, like it kind of been dragged out, dragged out from the back of a couch or something. Early on, Luke gave me uh, reference images about how he wanted it to look and all the images looked like they were shot on film and that they were kind of old and faded so as we were shooting digitally uh, what we needed to do was try and get as much texture uh, into that digital image as possible. So the main factor of that is that I chose to use Cook anamorphic lenses. I find when you shoot wider than T4 you get a quite a nice vintage quality out of the lenses. And I also think that the Cook anamorphic lenses uh, have a really kind of classic movie quality to them. We also used a half black satin in the matte box for the whole thing. Uh, that gave us some nice highlight blooming, but it didn't soften the image too much on top of those anamorphics. Uh, as well, we experimented with underexposing the Sony Venice that we shot on. I wanted to add more noise into it because I think the Venice noise has quite a nice film grain quality to it. So in the end, we shot at a base of 2,500 and underexposed by one stop. And even then, in the end, it wasn't enough grain for us. We actually ended up adding more grain in post anyway. And finally, I used a lighting camera um, on the day as a reference, which was a desaturated Kodak film emulsion LUT just to move the colours in a bit more of a filmic reproduction. And action. New cavernous crunch from Garrison's taste different. Dynamite different. So the the characters in Midnight Snack was only one main human character. But if there was a second character, uh, it's definitely the television. <laughs> So good. The television stuff, it was important for me that it was on an old television that it felt genuinely like old television commercials and TV shows. So we referenced a lot of typically old 70s, 60s, 70s commercials. And visually it just, I felt it was very important that it, that it had that old videotape kind of aesthetic. All of the TV elements um, in the film, Luke felt strongly that he wanted it to be played out on the TV on the day, rather than putting it in post. Uh, if we added too much texture in camera, once it was on the TV and then seen through an anamorphic lens, it may have been too much. So I decided that we should shoot it on the Sony Venice in 4K 4x3 RAW with Zeiss Supreme Primes and Onjun Optimo Zooms, shooting at around T5.6. The reason for that was that it would give us clean images with minimal distortion um, so that we could add as little or, or as much texturing in post as we wanted. 
Um, so in the end, we were able to make different levels of vintage look and try them all out on the day and then pick the one that worked best for the TV. And in the end, the one that we chose was um, Luke actually took the footage to a post house, had it put down to VHS and then re-digitized and that gave it lots of great analog grime to it. So we push that forward and clear the door, please. And we're not there, yeah. So I wanted the audience to essentially be kind of transfixed and hypnotized by the film and just lured in the same way that the character is, just following the instincts of the camera to guide them through the story. So there were several challenging tracking shots to do in this short. Luke specifically described a shot which would be basically a 180 degree track around a sofa revealing the TV, all on quite a tight lens. Uh, on top of that, a lot of the tracks were gonna have to take place in very narrow spaces, um, which meant that we couldn't use a nice heavyweight dolly that we would like to use to get the nice smooth tracks that we wanted. So what I decided to do was put a gimbal onto a lightweight dolly, and I chose the Ronin 2 because it was big enough for the Venice. The Ronin 2 was able to smooth out all the tracks to make them extra smooth, as well as meaning that I could remotely operate uh, the pan and tilt, um, which means I didn't have to squeeze into these small spaces or ride on the dolly when we were doing these quick tracks. Uh, the only way we were able to do this setup was because we were on the Venice and then we could use the sensor extension unit. That meant that we could remove the sensor from the front of the Venice, so it would be about that wide. Um, and it was so lightweight, we could then use the really heavy Cook Anamorphics have a matte box with a filter on the front, a cine tape and a wireless lens control all rigged onto this gimbal uh, because most of the body was separated on and just sitting on the dolly. Yeah. 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 yeah see, there we go. You've got some leverage. Great. Okay. I think we I think we're just going to have to turn Let's just and roll see what we get. And go, yeah. go for it. Lovely. We are recording sound, so nice and quiet. That'd be great. Let me just As the content of the film was pretty out there, I was keen to try it as much as possible to ground the lighting in reality. The main issue that we had at the location was it was a very old house and the wiring um, was very unreliable. So effectively we couldn't use any of the mains power that was there for lighting. So as a result, I decided to use all LED lighting so that we could battery power everything. Also in the kitchen scene, um, there were no practical lights at all. Um, and we wanted to have a lighting cue of a flickering light. Now, usually you would have to have lots of time to uh, rig lights to the ceiling with various grips. Then you've got to worry about the cabling. And then to have one of them flicker, you would have to have some sort of DMX system uh, and then a light that could have a flickering effect put on it. Uh, we didn't have that much time to shoot. The perfect solution for us was the Astera Pixel Tubes, the AX ones. Because they're an LED tube that has a built-in battery, so there's no cabling at all. It makes them lightweight enough that we were able just to Velcro them to the ceiling and under the cupboards where we wanted to use them. Um, they're also RGB, so we were able to dial in a specific colour into them because I also wanted them to feel like sickly green fluorescent lights, so we were able to dial that in without using any gels. And then the best thing about them is you can program effects into them just via a tablet. We were able to set individual light levels for the steerers, then set one to flicker. We're able to then turn them all on at the same time when she flicks the light on, and then halfway through the scene, stop that one from flickering or from a tablet with no cabling whatsoever, which I don't think you can do with any other kind of light. Uh, can so we just try eating one of the dates? Is she enjoying it? Or is it a chore? Cool. So, or is it nothing? Just kind of nothing, I think, at the minute. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just, just eating, eating. Good. you know, you good? mindlessly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a big fan of extreme close-ups in films. I think when they're done really well, they can feel very bold. So I was very keen to get some great uh, extreme close-ups in this. And I also just wanted to make the film feel fairly claustrophobic. So the main issue with that is that we had chosen to shoot on anamorphic lenses which due to their optics means that usually they don't have a very close focus and I was concerned that even with diopters we weren't going to be able to fill 
the frame with these images that Luke wanted. So in the end, we chose to use a spherical 100 mil macro. The issue on top of that is that then, usually you would have to then go to a Super 35 on most cameras and then letterbox that again to 2.39 by one. And your perspective compared to two times anamorphic goes from this to like that. What the Venice gave us was that it has a full frame sensor. So we got a 100 mil macro that covers full frame shoot 2.39 by one full frame and then when you compare that to a de-squeezed 4x3 from a two times anamorphic the perspectives are almost the same so even though we we're going to spherical lenses for the tights we were able to keep our wide field of view. So Shift4 have been really wonderful to work with they've been involved in the project since the very beginning and have been incredibly generous with their time and their expertise and yeah, they've been an absolute joy to work with you know, and opened up literally anything that they could out of their very generous toolbox for us to play around with and it's been heaps of fun.